In our last episode, we worked on wishful thinking for four weeks ready to launch her, but discovered a leak on launch day and had to be lifted back out. In this episode, we'll show you what we did to fix the leak and make a second launch attempt to finally start our journey. The leak came from a through-hole fitting for one of our centre cockpit drains. We'd replaced these ourselves weeks earlier. We researched it carefully and got lots of advice, but the through-hole fittings were slightly too small for the holes in the boat, so the sealant we'd used wasn't enough to create a proper seal. When fitting the through-hole, it also didn't tighten down well like the others due to the angle inside the hull. We should have stopped work and reassessed what to do, but due to inexperience we went ahead anyway. This ultimately caused the leak and cost us lots of time and money. Our solution was to join the two cockpit drain pipes with a T-fitting which would go into the one through hole that didn't leak. We'd then replace that fitting again for peace of mind. For the leaky through hole we decided to remove it entirely and fiberglass over the hole. We'd lose some of our cockpit drainage capacity but it would do for the season until we could re-drill a correctly sized hole. Shout out to Ryan's workmate Cade who talked us through how to fiberglass over the phone and sent us these instructions to follow. There were also lots of great people around the boatyard who helped us out, including our new friend Pete who made the trip up from Lefkis. First Ryan removed the fitting and the surrounding gel coat and created a slightly concave indent in the hull with the grinder. We then roughed the surface with sandpaper so the epoxy would stick well. Next we put seven layers of glass on the outside. We then made a mixture of epoxy, chopped fiberglass strands and baby talc powder to create a thickened epoxy plug in the middle to fill the hole. Finally, we put another seven layers of glass on the inside. As this was our first time working with fiberglass, we weren't sure how it would go and were a bit nervous because the marina lift sling would sit directly over our repair. It seemed to set well though and we felt a bit more confident when the Italian technicians working on the boat next to us looked at our handiwork and said bravo. We also booked a new lift in date before we missed out. We allowed 10 days so we'd have plenty of time for the epoxy to cure. We weren't that keen to stay longer in the boatyard but knew that the work had to be done properly. The previous owner had chosen this marina and paid for it up until July which was great. For the price he'd paid though we weren't that happy with the service. Their technical department needed a month's notice before doing any work and if you wanted to engage your own contractor you had to pay the marina a surcharge. Their rules also said that you couldn't do certain work below the waterline on your boat, but luckily they didn't enforce this so we did pretty much all of the work ourselves. We kept busy by getting some more jobs done. Our compass was nearly empty of oil. It's quite old and must be leaking from somewhere but we couldn't find where. We wanted to top up the oil but there was no access point, so we decided to drill a hole in the side and inject oil in with a syringe then seal it back up. We used baby oil because we'd read that it's the cheapest mineral oil. Now the oil has warmed up in the compass, it's clear with no air bubbles. We also serviced all of our winches, replaced the carpet in our V-berth and sanded and painted the wall.
we continued our attempts to get our saloon cushions recovered. We dropped them into one place but were quoted three and a half thousand euros for the job so went and picked them straight back up again. We tried some cheaper places but no one seemed interested in the work so we gave up and decided we'd get them done in Turkey instead. We broke up the time with a few trips on the ferry into Preveza to get supplies and do some jobs. We had the boat all clean ready to go but then had some showers of rain which seemed to bring down dirt with it. Our neighbour in the boatyard had said that when there's a southerly wind it blows up sand and dust from the Sahara Desert which then comes down in the rain. So this red dust was all over our boat and apparently if you don't clean it off it can stain. So we washed the deck multiple times and couldn't hang out any washing. Finally it was time for our second launch attempt. We were a bit calmer this time as we'd been through the process before, but were nervous to make sure that our repairs would hold up. Thankfully there were no issues and we motored out of the marina struggling to believe it was actually happening. We had a night anchored off Preveza just across the bay to get settled. We basically slept all afternoon after all the stress and excitement of our launch. Fishermen were netting the anchorage probably because the fish were attracted to food scraps from boat sinks. You'd have to be pretty careful motoring in at night not to pick up one of their nets. The next morning Ryan went up the mast because our anchor light was out. He changed the bulb but it still didn't work so we'll have to try and find the fault in the wiring or get a new light fitting. We then made our way through the Ionian and Gulf of Corinth towards the Saronic Islands where we'd be meeting some family in 10 days time. It would be a mission but we had to head east to get to Turkey by mid-July anyway due to our visa restrictions. Our first adventure was to transit the Lefkas Canal after waiting for the bridge to open on the hour. There were lots of other boats doing the same thing. Our first stop was at Varco Bay. The wind blew hard that night even though the bay was meant to be protected for the forecast but the anchor held well. The water was beautiful and there were goats climbing the cliffs and grazing. We left the next morning and continued our journey learning about the boat's quirks along the way. I've been issues with the depth gauge so I've been in the water making sure we haven't caught a fishing net or something because it was raining 5 metres and we should be in like 200 metres of water where we were before and where we are now should be 300. We're still getting readings on the depth gauge saying 20 metres now which is the deepest it's been for a while. Potentially we're just in an area where it's too deep to get a reading but the 
some transducers bouncing off other things like maybe some if it's been murky in the water it's about to get a reading off something else. <laughs> Worried us for a while. And um, yeah, I jump in the water before with the goggles on. Keep it like Ian Forth. <laughs> Have a look under there, but there's nothing under there, so hopefully we're okay. Our next stop was a bay at Kalamos, which seemed great. We were looking at the Navali app and Rod Heichel's Greek Waters pilot book to decide where to go, as well as checking the forecasted wind and swell. We got to the bay and found a spot, but it was a bit crowded and we couldn't put out as much chain as we would have liked. It was also pretty deep because the coastline just dropped away like much of Greece. We watched as the boat nearby dragged anchor out into the bay. We didn't feel comfortable staying, so at about 6.30 that night we decided to leave. The wind was blowing and a squall was passing in the distance, but we figured it was better to leave than risk dragging anchor during the night. We motored to Mytikis, two hours away, where we found lots of room and good holding for the anchor. We now look at anchorages differently. Regardless of whether there's an anchor symbol on Navali, we check the depth contours and available swing area using Navionics. If we arrive and it's too crowded or we have issues setting the anchor, we move on to another spot, always having a backup option. Our next stops were Patalis Bay and Missolonghi, where we reprovisioned. We also practiced med mooring while the town quay was empty. It's really calm here this morning, so it's a good place to practice. But it reversed really straight, it wasn't trying to get around or anything, so that was really reassuring. I just imagined there was a boat there that I had to pass, and then I started to turn. I probably turned a little bit too early, because the first time I came in, I was, wasn't quite on the bollard. Um, so, because of the videos that I've watched, you basically, as soon as you, you're in line with the boat next door, then you start to turn hard. So, I think that would sort of uh, work a bit better if there was a boat there that you could visually see. But yeah, backed in pretty well. And, by the time I turned around and straightened up, we were in a pretty good location to drop the anchor, about 50 metres out. Jake, this is sailing vessel Wishful Thinking, Wishful Thinking, one nautical mile from the bridge. Okay, Wishful Thinking, uh, clear on the machine. Have a nice trip. It's the mast, we're going to make it too high and snap it off. You reckon we're going to make it? It doesn't look too far from the top. Yeah, it does, it does, it We launched our dinghy for the first time at Nafpaktos, which also ironically has a leak, which seems to be coming from a dodgy bung. We'll look into fixing it, but are considering buying a dinghy with a hard bottom so it's a bit sturdier. We sailed for the first time out of Nafpaktos as this was the first day we'd had any wind. Unfortunately, it was blowing from the direction that we wanted to go. Yeah, so we're just motoring today, unfortunately, all the way from Nafpaktos to Galaxidi, which is about five hours away. Even though there's 15 knots of wind, it's right on our nose. So we attempted to sail for a little bit and mucked around for probably 40 minutes or something and didn't, we could still see Nafpaktos just just over the bay so 
we kind of realised it was going to take us all day to get there and when we just need to motor because we're on a little bit of a tight time schedule. We made it to Galaxidi and managed to accomplish our first med mooring between two other boats with our anchor set 50 metres out and two stern lines to the town quay. We were pretty nervous as we reversed in, but luckily there were two lovely strangers on the quay ready to catch our lines and help us out. Our final stop in the Gulf before transiting the Corinth Canal was a beautiful bay called Agios Isidoros. We learnt a lot over the past 10 days about the boat and ourselves, and there's lots of lessons to come. There were plenty of stressful moments, but also some of the most exciting and rewarding days of our lives. Join us next time when we transit the Corinth Canal and enter the Saronic Islands.